here. All right, and then I am Kristen. I send all the ADHDKC meeting messages and newsletters and signups and everything. Um, I'm excited to have Jamie Neal Lewis, a nurse practitioner at Children's Mercy, talk. She is in the ADHD clinic right now, but she previously worked in their sleep clinic. So um, she has six years of experience in the sleep clinic. So very expert advice tonight coming from her. And I'm super excited because everybody has sleep issues at some point, but people with ADHD definitely have more. So I'm excited to hear this topic and see if we can all get hints. And I know some of what she's going to say, and I know that it's hard to follow the advice. So hearing it once again will help reinforce what we need to do. So take it away. All right. Let me see if I can get my screen shared here. Can you guys all see that? Okay, I see some nods, so I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna get started then. So I'm Jamie, I'm a nurse practitioner at Children's Mercy, and I, I currently work in the ADHD clinic, and I do some developmental and behavioral clinic as well. Um, I did work in the sleep clinic at Children's Mercy for about six years, which is kind of when I developed my interest in, oh, you know, there's so much, so much mental health and other diagnoses going on um, with, in people with sleep problems. So really, really kind of piqued my interest. And so now I find myself kind of in my dream job, um, taking care of kids uh, with ADHD and, and autism and different things like that. So I was excited to, to get this opportunity. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Nobody pays me any extra money to do anything. Um, so sorry to me, I guess, but it's just me. Here tonight. Um, objectives, just kind of some of the things we're going to go through. Uh, quickly, we'll review the recommended sleep durations by age. Um, we'll discuss kind of how common sleep problems are in people with ADHD. I'm going to go through and kind of explain some common sleep disorders in people with ADHD and review tips um, to help with sleep problems. And then we should have plenty of time for um, questions and discussions at the end. So first of all, um, this is from the National Sleep Foundation. Uh, that's a group that kind of studies trends in the American population, and they do a different kind of survey every year. And so this came out about maybe five years ago. You can see, can you see my mouse when I move it? Yeah, okay. So you can see there's a recommended column. Well, first there's an age, and then there's a recommended in hours, and then a maybe appropriate column in hours, and then not recommended. So they didn't come out with like a hard and fast, you have to have this many hours of sleep. But for probably for the group that I take care of, I take care of kids since I work at Children's Mercy, you can see that preschoolers here, 10 to 13 hours total of sleep in a 24-hour period, but some of them might be okay with eight to nine hours. And then we go through the different age groups here, and we see that here's the recommended in this column here based on age, but it might be okay if there's no daytime consequences of sleepiness, then maybe seven hours is okay. Or it's hard to think of a preschooler at this age going eight hours every night and not having daytime sleepiness but, or other issues. But that's where, those are the recommendations for people without any other um, health problems. So how common are um, sleep problems in people with ADHD? Well, when I kind of look through the research, I found different studies that gave us different numbers. So it appeared to be most commonly in about 25 to 50% of people of all ages who have ADHD have a sleep problem. But then I found other studies that said up to 55% of children and another study that showed up to 70% of people with ADHD. So the point of this is we know it's common and it's there. Um, what's interesting about ADHD is having trouble sleeping is not one of the diagnoses diagnostic criteria. So we have to make sure that we really ask about it because sometimes sleep problems um, can be overlooked. Um, the other thing that's interesting about sleep and ADHD is that adults who, do, who don't get the recommended amount of sleep at night are more likely to report symptoms of ADHD. So that makes sense. If you're tired, you guys are parents or teenagers, if you've been up late, you didn't sleep for whatever reason, you wake up the, the next day, you might find you're doing things to kind of keep yourself awake, like maybe you're moving around more or maybe you're having trouble concentrating. So in adults, um, that's something that they look at really closely is, is how much sleep they're getting. Um, sleep problems can potentially be a sec separate problem from ADHD or potentially associated with ADHD or potentially associated with medications that we use to treat ADHD, although the, there's 
results of research and studies done on medications and stuff are kind of all over the board. Um, sleep problems definitely can um, lead to daytime tiredness, fatigue, they can interfere with mood, attention, behavior, and physical health. Um, and again, they're often overlooked. So if you're seeing a provider for ADHD, make sure that you're kind of talking about sleep and, and going through those things if they're not asking. So why are sleep problems so common in ADHD? Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons that we're looking at. We don't know for sure. Um, it looks like there's genes, and of course they come up with these cute names like clock, the clock gene might be off, or another gene um, that doesn't have as cute of a name, but it's, it stands for um, COMT. These genes have been identified um, as potential reasons why people, um, circadian rhythms are off. Um, it could just be a primary sleep disorder, which we'll kind of talk a little bit more. It could be that that's just how the ADHD brain works, that it just has that trouble shutting down or won't shut down. Or maybe it's a combination of ADHD with other mental health problems that commonly occur. So in children, we're commonly uh, screening for anxiety or what's called oppositional defiant disorder. But in adults, there could be other things going on as well, such as anxiety, depression sometimes causes problems sleeping or post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. So there's lots of reasons um, that could be going on. So this is one of the conceptual models I found that was pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. You can see on the left-hand column here that Maybe ADHD is the primary column. So the ADHD itself leads to the sleep problem. And so treating the ADHD might help with the sleep. And then here's the next theory. Maybe it's an interaction. Maybe ADHD and other mental health problems contribute to sleep problems. And then maybe there's brain chemicals or something about our bodies that contribute to all of the above. So we have to treat both. Maybe it's a sleep problem that's different than than ADHD, maybe they're working together, so we've got to find something to do, treat both of those together, or maybe the sleep problem is the primary problem. Maybe the sleep disturbances um, are mimicking symptoms of ADHD, but maybe it's because someone is, seems to be sleeping you know, eight hours a night, but they're, they have micro wake-ups throughout the night, so they're waking up multiple times, and then therefore the next day, they feel tired. So treating the sleep disorder might help improve the symptoms of ADHD. So what are the common sleep disorders in people with ADHD? I almost didn't include this slide because I'm like, these are the people that will know what the common sleep disorders are in people with ADHD. So on research, however, parents of children with ADHD commonly report trouble falling asleep, maybe some bedtime resistance, got to kind of you know, pick, through, pick that apart and figure out what that is. So nighttime awakenings, so people that just wake up at night, decreased amount of sleep at night, and also bedwetting. Um, formal sleep studies for kids that have ADHD also reveal they might have a, a higher chance of having sleep disordered breathing, like obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and periodic leg movements of, of sleep. So we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk about that as well. So here's, here's a nice chart about prevalence of sleep problems in 251 children with ADHD. You can see this one, they, when they ask the parents, they just ask them to describe, does your child have mild, moderate, or severe sleep problems? So I don't have a definition for what that means, but you can see that parents reported just mild cases of difficulty falling asleep in 70%. But if they had moderate or severe problems, that could be a little bit higher. So you can see that resisting going to bed, tiredness on waking, difficulty getting up in the morning, tossing and turning, waking up frequently, and snoring, all of these things came up um, on, a, on a parent survey. So trouble falling asleep and bedtime resistance. So I heard this um, on someone else giving a talk about ADHD and sleep about a quote that one of their patients had said, and that was, to someone with ADHD, going to bed is sitting in a boring, dark room waiting for nothing to happen. Um, so that was from a psychologist that kind of specializes in treating adults more with ADHD, but that's what one of the adult patients said. And for, for a lot of us, we'd be like, yes, bedtime, I'm going to fall right to sleep. But not all people with ADHD have that same are, are, are able to do that. So, you know, is it a disturbance of the circadian rhythm, which is the body's natural um, pattern of when you want to fall asleep and when you wake up? And you can think of that as like, are you, I'm more of a night owl or I'm more of a morning person or, you know, that, 
that type of thing. So we think there might be a delayed pattern of melatonin secretion in children with ADHD compared to children without ADHD. And what they, they did study on that to, to look and see if that was the case, and that might be another reason. Um, maybe kids with ADHD are more likely to be night owls or perhaps adult as well. And then in adults, if they have delayed melatonin secretion, um, some of the gene expression and physical activity, you know, and different things that adults might do that contribute um, to the tendency to um, have trouble falling asleep. And the insomnia may correlate with severity of ADHD symptoms in adults, but not necessarily with kids. So if you're a parent of a child, their ADHD symptoms might be okay, even if they're or well controlled rather, even if they're poor sleepers, but in adults, they kind of go hand in hand. So nighttime awakenings. So this, this one um, study here showed up to 56% of kids with ADHD had nighttime awakenings on a sleep study. Maybe related to increased movements during sleep, um, but the key about waking up at night is that if you wake up, as long as you can go right back to sleep, maybe not a big deal. And maybe if you only woke up one time or two times. Um, but the other things they found on sleep studies for kids with ADHD that seemed to maybe be a little bit more, more common were sleep talking, sleep walking, and teeth grinding. We also know that um, kids with ADHD tend to sleep fewer hours at night. Um, so that, that's not helpful as a parent, right? I'm, you know, as a parent, I'm like, please just go to sleep. Um, I've got things to do. And so if you already know that your child is, has trouble going to sleep and sleeps less at night than other kids, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to handle. They may also have more daytime sleepiness. And again, people with ADHD, even kids might be doing some of the motor activity or some of the other things to help stay awake. And research has demonstrated that kids with ADHD get about half an hour less sleep at night than kids without ADHD. And as a parent, I need that half hour, right? So that's just, you know, how, how life goes. R really need that, ha that extra half hour, and that child is going to need that extra half hour as well. Um, so sleep disordered breathing. So this is when people have changes in their breathing patterns while they're asleep, and it can range just from snoring. So you can snore and not have sleep apnea, or you can have obstructive sleep apnea, which is when you probably snore and also have pauses in your breathing. So we all have these. We all have have pauses in our breathing. There's kind of considered a normal amount, which is a, maybe a couple times per hour, maybe a handful for adults. But for kids or adults, if you have more than the kind of normal number and it affects your quality of sleep, then we need to do something about it. So obstructive sleep apnea is consistently associated with behavioral and cognitive defi deficits, inattention, and ADHD-like symptoms, especially in adults. Um, the, how common or the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in patients in ADHD is higher than in the general population. So could be as high as a third of people with ADHD also have obstructive sleep apnea compared to 3% of patients that don't have ADHD. Um, and we do know that treatment of obstructive sleep apnea has shown improvements in ADHD symptoms. And then treatment might include medications. In kids, commonly they'll say, uh, let's do a surgery to take out tonsils and or the adenoids or CPAP, which are kind of the breathing machine. It can go over your nose or go over your nose and mouth um, to help you, help you sleep better. So restless leg syndrome is defined as an ir irresistible urge to move the legs to relieve an uncomfortable sensation when you're at rest. So this is an awake daytime phenomenon. It's usually worse in the evenings or at bedtime. And about 2% of children without ADHD might have restless leg syndrome, but up to 44% of kids with ADHD have restless leg syndrome. So what you might see is they're wiggling around, kids who are just restless, they can't settle down, and maybe they're just not old enough or even able to articulate um, what's going on. So in order to get this diagnosis in kids, we kind of they kind of have to describe it using their own words. And the common descriptions that I've heard over the years is, um, it feels like bugs are crawling on me and I have to scratch and move. I've got to get that, that bug sensation off. Or some kids will say, um, my legs feel like I need to run. They just, they want to
Can you guys hear her now? She locked up. Now? Jamie, are you still there? Sleep, and I'll say, well, what do your legs want to do instead? And then that's when they might say, they might want to, they run or, um, am, am I okay? Yeah, okay, I just got a, a warning, we missed, okay. We missed you for a few minutes there. Like, oh, a few, a few minutes? Well, not minutes. Okay. I can't remember what you were saying last. You, um, you were talking about 2% of kids with that. Okay, right here. Is that okay. about where she was? Is that right, Aunt? I can see Aya's face. Or okay. Aya's face. I'm not sure you say that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just kind of pick, pick it up from there. So um, restless leg syndrome in kids, kind of, they have to kind of use their own words. And so the common descriptions that, that I've typically heard from my patients in the past have been, it feels like bugs are crawling on me and I have to move my arms or I have to scratch to get or rub, rub my arms or rub my legs together um, to get rid of that feeling. Or other kids will say, it feels like, you know, my, my legs need to run. So as a provider, one of the ways I've kind of learned to ask this question is, what part of your body can't fall asleep? And so if kids can say, oh, it's my head, then you can say, then I would say like, oh, well, what, what's going on in your head or my brain? But if they say, oh, my legs, then I'm going to be kind of clued in and I'm going to say, well, what, what's going on with your legs? What, what's what's happening. And so then if kids, you know, kids can just come out and, and say it. And commonly it's something having to do with, it feels like bugs or creepy crawlies or something, or that my legs aren't tired. They just want to run. And if that's the case, then I would say, well, then that's probably restless leg syndrome. So when we um, suspect that, what, what we do is get a little bit of blood drawn. Uh, it's called ferritin. It's a protein that transports iron. And if the ferritin is low, then most of the time we would supplement with an oral iron over-the-counter medication. So I would say, don't just put your child on iron. We should be checking and measuring and doing it safely. Um, a multivitamin with iron is probably not going to be high enough iron if that's what we need to do. So if anyone's concerned about this, talk to your provider and probably what they'll do is um, recommend getting a, a ferritin, uh, which is blood work, getting that drawn. So periodic limb movement disorder of sleep is kind of the nighttime, kind of the sister condition of restless leg syndrome. It only happens when you're asleep. So you don't know it's happening. It's um, when you have limb movements, arms or legs of a specific nature and frequency, frequency that are measured during sleep study. So obstructive sleep apnea and periodic limb movement disorder of sleep have to be diagnosed on the sleep study. Restless leg syndrome can be diagnosed in the clinic with your provider based on the description, if that's what's happening. Um, the limb movements must also disrupt the sleep. So you can have somebody who moves 50 times an hour, but it never wakes them up and their brain stays in those same levels of sleep that they should be in, versus somebody who moves 15 times an hour, but every single time they move, it disrupts their sleep and knocks them out of dream sleep or knocks them out of deep sleep or different things like that. But we also know that this condition, periodic limb movement disorder of sleep, is also um, increased in, in people with ADHD. So bedwetting, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about this. We know that about 15 to 20 percent of all kids that wet the bed have ADHD, but about 30 percent of kids with ADHD wet the bed. So it's very common. We don't really know why. There's also several theories on, on why that would be, um, but there, there are a couple people who study um, ADHD and bedwetting and different things like that, and it looks like that kids with ADHD with bedwetting might be a little bit harder to treat, meaning that maybe they don't respond to medications um, the same, but the options are there, there is a a medication for bedwetting. There's a bedwetting alarm, which I would kind of say is a brain trainer for deep sleepers. Or there's some research that says for some kids with certain types of bladder problems, increasing the stimulant dose by just a little bit during the day can help with some of the bladder problems. Um, and that seems to be a little bit more specific for kids with ADHD that are having daytime like bladder accidents. Um, but that, that's an interesting phenomenon that also occurs a little bit higher in kids with ADHD. So decreased alertness, um, again, these things are probably all related, but it's po possibly related to the poor sleep. Maybe the excessive movement could be a strategy to stay awake and alert in kids, something I've kind of already um, mentioned. 
um, and sleep studies have confirmed daytime sleepiness in children and adolescents and, adolescents and adults with ADHD, but especially in adults. So weight in ADHD. I think a lot of people kind of think about, or at least people in the medical field until you know a lot more detail about ADHD kind of assume that, oh, they have ADHD, um, they probably are really skinny or something like that. Um, is my connection still okay? I just got another warning, okay. Um, but the research actually shows that the prevalence of ADHD is higher than expected in people with obesity. So the BMI is higher in adults with ADHD. Um, obesity is correlated with sleep disor disordered breathing and other sleep disorders. So if you're overweight or obese, you also gain weight in your neck. And then when you're laying flat on your back, which is how most of us sleep, then you've just got a little bit more weight in your neck. And so sometimes one of the ways that they'll treat obstructive sleep apnea is having people lose weight because then they might lose weight, you know, in their face and in their neck as well. But one of the other theories is that maybe impulsive eating, so impulsivity that goes with um, ADHD can be related to obesity. So sleep disorders in children with ADHD affect the whole family. Like you guys didn't need me to come here and tell you that, right? You could, you could already tell me that. Um, but I did want to pull some, some data here that said in a, two, a 2008 study, this is the one I um, mentioned earlier with 251 kids kind of looking at sleep problems. And again, they just rated it as no problems, mild, moderate, or severe. So we don't know what each person, how they judged whether their child had mild, moderate, or severe sleep problems. But what we did find is there's um, increased parental stress. There might be poor mental health in parents with children with ADHD who have moderate or sleep problems. It's just another battle um, to kind of fight. And that primary caregivers, whether it was two parents in the home, a single parent, single mother, single father, were 2.7 2 times more likely to be clinically depressed, stressed, or anxious than if their child had no sleep problems. Because again, we think about all these things that go on and having good, healthy sleep helps with lots of different things, okay? Um, the other thing they found is that parents of children with ADHD are more likely to be late for work probably has something to do with how those mornings go for kids with ADHD. So that what they found in this same study for sleep problems in children is that children with uh, sleep, sleep problems had lower quality of life. So that's when they kind of ask about, you know, do you feel that your quality of life in this area is good, bad, different things like that. Um, but sleep problems were correlated with poorer quality of life. They're also more likely to completely miss school and more likely to be late for school. So how do sleep problems affect ADHD? Again, poor sleep may lower the metabolism, increases the appetite, maybe increases the risk for obesity. Um, sleep problems we also think increase the hyperactivity, increase the impulsivity, the inattentiveness. Um, we talk a lot about emotional impulsivity or emotional dysregulation in ADHD, which also kind of makes sense because when you're tired, you're probably a little bit easier to snap, maybe a little angrier, different things like that. So moodiness and irritability also increases. So how can we assess sleep problems? You guys also don't need me to tell you this as, as the parents. My job as the provider would be like, okay, let's get some, let's get some data. Let's take a sleep diary. So that means um, what time did you get in bed? What time do you think you, you fell asleep? And then what time did you wake up? So the research shows that people with ADHD tend to overestimate how much sleep they're getting. So for me to say, how, what times do you go to bed? What times do you wake up? And, you know, sleeping the whole, whole time? Well, that's some information, but maybe more details um, would help give us other information. And then also comparing school nights, how, you know, bedtime on school nights is nine and they get up at 6.30 for school, whatever. What happens on weekends? So what happens on Friday, Saturday, and maybe even Sunday? Because commonly, what we all like to do is sleep in on the weekends. So we're looking for a big difference there because one of the things that we know is if for people that have sleep problems, if they vary their sleep pattern by more than an hour, um, then they're gonna have more trouble getting back on the regular school night um, schedule. Also, where do we sleep? Um, that has been an interesting question um, over my time working with parents and families. Um, in a bed is kind of the best place we want people, but not that doesn't always happen for different reasons, but we kind of want it in the same location. Um, so we want you in your room, in your bed um, every night. And so, you know, 
I've had patients that sleep on the bathroom floor because they wet the bed, you know, or different things like that. And that certainly doesn't make sleep problems any better. Um, but also thinking about what else are we doing in, in the bedrooms, which I'm going to talk a, a little bit about. How many times do you wake up at night? Can you tell what wakes you up? Do you take naps? Are you falling asleep? You know, because sometimes I'll say, do you take naps? And people will say no. And then I'll say, well, are you falling asleep or dozing off at school? And that might lead us to a different or, or get, you know, get us information we're looking for. And then what electronic devices are in the bedroom? So let's talk, I'm going to switch gears here and start talking about how we can maybe help for people with sleep problems. And that starts with healthy sleep practices. So sleep hygiene is kind of the term we call it. Um, and we'll talk about caffeine, electronic devices. We'll talk about exercise. Um, we'll talk a little bit about melatonin, a medication for sleep, stimulants, sleep studies, and waking up earlier. So healthy sleep practices, again, are are typically called sleep hygiene, and that's a modifiable daytime, bedtime, and nighttime practice that can have a positive impact on sleep. So the, the key about sleep is that we develop habits on how we sleep. So when we're talking about changing sleep patterns, it's all about changing habits, which some habits can be very difficult to break, okay? Now, changing sleep habits is kind of the first-line treatment for kids with ADHD and typically first-line treatment for all, all kids if they're having trouble with sleep. So keeping them on a regular sleep and wake schedule, giving them adequate opportunity for sleep, review, reviewing the recommended guidelines, which we already did, kind of looking at here's the recommendation for this age group, but this amount might be okay. And then looking for the other clues that the child's not getting enough sleep. So how much are they sleeping in on weekends? And over Labor Day, they're, you know, tr in a traditional year, we, we, they'd already be in school for you know, a few weeks and how, you know, do they sleep till noon on their one day, one extra day and they usually get up at 630 and are they, are they dozing off in school? So the sleep environment. So there's lots of, of things, you know, that everybody's heard about that can help make the, the sleep environment a little bit more specific for sleep. So one of the things, if you have a child that falls or that cannot fall asleep and has trouble is we would say nothing should be done in the bedroom other really than sleeping. So no timeouts. So no go to your room because you're in trouble. That's got to, you got to have a new place for timeouts. No doing homework in the bedroom and probably getting rid of all the electronics. So the National Sleep Foundation did find in one of their annual surveys a few years ago that just having any of those electronics in the room, even if they're off, decreases a person, a person's amount of sleep at night. So one of the things, you know, they'll say, oh, I can't fall asleep without the TV. Well, that's a habit and probably makes it actually a little bit harder to fall asleep. So we would say, we would recommend, you know, probably eliminating or getting rid of those electronics. Um, keeping the bedroom cool. So warmer bedrooms might be harder to sleep in. So keeping the room cool, and then if they need more blankets, then that might be an acceptable um, solution. Some people like weighted blankets. Um, you can kind of Google that and look that up because they're kind of weight-based. So you can't just go say, oh, I'm going to go buy a 20-pound blanket, you know, for me or my child. They, they base those, those weights, how much weight they actually put in the blanket based on how much the child weighs. And then there's, there's uh, research out there that says the smell of lavender or peppermint um, helps some people relax. Um, people can use white noise or soft, quiet music. Um, adults with ADHD sometimes say having um, music in the background if they wake up kind of helps keep them, makes it easier to go back to sleep. And then in a dark room. So we don't want a lot of lights. And again, sleeping with the TV on, a lot of people will say, I like the sound, I like the music. And if your child doesn't have any trouble sleeping and they fall asleep and they stay asleep, I'm not going to argue about TVs in the bedroom, but if you're saying, oh, well, my child can't sleep and, you know, all that, then one of the things I'm going to say is we're going to have to try getting that TV off or taking it out of the room, okay? The other thing that's important is if making sure the bedtime is appropriate. So if you're, if you want your kid to sleep by nine, but it takes them two hours, but they're 12, um, then putting them in bed at at seven or eight is probably just too early. So making sure that we have a, an appropriate bedtime um, so that they're not just laying in bed for hours not sleeping is really important as well. So bedtime routines, 
um, again, because power in repetition. So it occurs every night at the same time. It lasts about 30 to 60 minutes. It's not rushed, you know, like I am sometimes with my kids. Oh, we're late. Go get in bed. You know, all that stuff. Kind of having to be a little bit more planned, unpressured, hurried, ending on a positive note. And then some, some other things that, like, I don't typically think to ask people are choosing pajamas and clothing um, that's not irritating to the kids. So for kids that, you know, like to sleep with socks, they can sleep with socks, even if they are, you know, or the room seems hot, but they want to sleep with their socks, they can sleep with their socks. Or kids who get irritated with tags, um, making sure that that stuff's out. And then the other thing that is probably a challenge for my husband and I with our kids is no rough housing or exciting activities one to two hours prior to bedtime. I don't know what it is about my kids, but come like eight o'clock, they want to wrestle. Um, so we, you know, just working on those kinds of routines to say, you know, maybe we shouldn't wrestle, maybe we should do some some quieter activities. So for students, some of the things you could also do are having them do their homework earlier in the evening so that they're not anxious about trying to get their homework done or saving it for last last thing, and then they end up doing homework later. And then for younger kids, bedtime stories, baths, reading, and so replacing the wrestle mania that goes on in, in my house with puzzles or coloring or something a little bit more quiet will help some kids also kind of settle down and get ready for bed. And then behavioral interventions, these are also kind of the big habit changes. We have psychologists that kind of help people with this. These are, these are our kind of medical or psychological terms for some of the things we recommend. But, you know, sometimes um, if you put your child in bed and the big problem is that they cry until you come in, well, you know, one of the things you could do is, okay, we're going to let them cry for five minutes and then we go in. And then next time the interval is going to be 10 minutes and then we go in and then the next time the interval is going to be 15 minutes and you know and things like that the other thing um that i that um, i hear a lot is well they'll fall asleep okay but only if i'm in the room with them um so some there's there's lots of tips and strategies for that as well um which some you know it's gradually kind of removing the parent from the situation um the, the thing i've been hearing about a lot recently is, well, we're on summer sleep schedule, so what, what's the best thing to do to get ready to go back for school sleep schedule? Um, and a lot of, like this right here, we'll say, you know, trying to get them in bed earlier. One of the things that I like is actually waking them up a little bit earlier every day, and you can kind of keep the bedtime the same for the first few days, because waking up earlier, even if it, you know, small, small changes, 15 minutes early, 20 minutes early, will drive that sleep pressure then at bedtime. So if you gradually start waking them up a little earlier, then, then the sleep pressure, the sleep drive to go to sleep a little bit earlier will follow behind that. So caffeine. So this is really important um, to talk about. A lot of, probably most of us um, really underestimate the power of caffeine. Um, it can last for 24 hours in the system. We want to make sure if you have ADHD and you're having trouble sleeping that you're not drinking t caffeine at, at least four hours before bedtime. But the other thing to note is caffeine can be in hidden places. So most of us could say, yeah, coffee, pop, um, but a lot of people wouldn't think about tea. Tea doesn't have as much. Wouldn't think about chocolate or candy or cough medicine, cold medicine. Caffeine can kind of be hidden. And so the next thing you know, your child that has trouble sleeping also has a cough and you get them some cold medicine and, oh, shoot, there was caffeine in there. So just kind of thinking about, you know, being aware of that when you have to make those types of parenting decisions. Now, caffeine has shown to increase alertness and performance in situations of sleep deprivation but not for chronic use. Chronic use of caffeine actually contributes more to daytime sleepiness, okay? So the enhanced alertness might be, I was up till 2 a.m. with my kid who was sick last night and then I had to get up at six to get ready for work, maybe that afternoon, having an extra cup of coffee or something like that for that one day is gonna help me get through the day. But again, it's not about chronic um, caffeine use. So here's a little chart that I just put in here just for fun because it, it kind of showed how much um, caffeine is in typical things that we would eat. So a regular cup of coffee, anywhere between 80 and 135 milligrams of um, caffeine. But look down here at your, your drips with less volume, but but probably more caffeine. And look at the Starbucks, regular coffee. Of course, that's 16 ounces. And regular coffee up here is eight ounces. So, you know, just thinking about, you know, 
um, it seems like my nephews who are teenagers, the cool thing to do is take a picture of your, co your Starbucks coffee and thanks mom. And then you post it on your Instagram. So we know, or, you know, whatever the kids are using, we know they're, they're going there and going for caffeine, but soda pop, um, soda pop has lots of caffeine in it. And then looking here at teas, some of the teas, um, have a lot of caffeine. It would be almost like having a cup of coffee. So just, you know, thinking about that stuff. Um, Red Bulls, um, Red Devils, all that kind of stuff. There's lots of those energy drinks out there. So just keeping an eye if your child or you're drinking a lot of that, um, it's probably uh, making sure that that is done minimally and earlier in the day. So I already talked a little bit about this, but electronics, um, in the room. So TVs, computers, tablets, phones, video games, all that kind of stuff. Making sure you're turning all that stuff off at least one hour before bedtime. And that's because what scientists think is that the backlight or, or the blue light, as we call it, from those devices suppresses the body's natural melatonin excretion. So melatonin is a hormone that all of our bodies make, and it's kind of the sleep hormone. And what what we think is important about that is before we had electricity is when, before we had electricity how did people know to wake up and when to go to bed they knew from daylight when it started to get dark it's time to go to bed and when it starts to get light that's when it's time to wake up but now we have lights and all sorts of fun things to keep us awake and tv shows to binge watch and all sorts of stuff but all of that all of that blue light we think suppresses your body's natural sleep um, hormone or melatonin. So if you're staying up late pay, playing, watching TV, you're doing whatever, and you're like, well, I'm not tired, I'm not tired, probably because you need to turn that device off. And so most people would say, turn the devices off about one hour before you want to go to bed. So exercise. Um, lots of benefits from exercise. You guys don't need me to tell you this pretty much everybody's heard this. Um, exercise can decrease the reverse effects of stress. It promotes brain growth, brain efficiency, learning. Um, in brains with ADHD, exercise improves executive functioning, attention, working memory. The goal for all people is about one hour per day, but you don't have to do it all at once. You can do 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. You can do 20 minutes, different things like that. Should be moderate to vigorous, so you're breathing hard, but you don't have to just be exhausted, so you don't have to go run the marathon you know, just um, get started somehow. Vary the activities. Don't be afraid to try new ones. Find a buddy. And for kids, especially, encouraging outdoor play. And doing something is better than nothing. So there's lots of good sports for people with ADHD. There's lots of kids that love to do, you know, things, get involved. Um, so I found this on the Attitude website. They've got lots of different things, but um, rock climbing, soccer, juggling, you know, all of these things here can help with coordination, can help with concentration, help with focus, um, different things like that. And then like for kids who don't like to do team sports, there's also running, there's also martial arts. So they, they do have to stay focused and it can, it can help with lots of those um, things that are, seem to be missing sometimes in some kids with ADHD. So it can help with concentration. Um, so medications for sleep. I'm only going to talk about melatonin because that's been widely researched and, and shown to be safe and effective in children. So again, melatonin is the body's natural sleep hormone. It has been shown to be effective in helping people with ADHD fall asleep, typically taken about an hour, maybe two hours before bed. I believe some of the newer research is starting to say maybe we should be taking melatonin earlier. Um, in the day, maybe more like four hours prior to bedtime. Um, melatonin can be purchased over the counter. Um, one thing that's important about melatonin over the counter is that since it's not regulated by the FDA, one brand that says this is a one milligram tablet may not really have one milligram worth of melatonin in it. So if you're having trouble, it might be worth to try different brands. The other option is to consider pharmaceutical grade melatonin, which is most likely going to have the amount of melatonin in it that it says um, it's going to be there. Um, you guys probably know there are prescription medications for sleep, but these are not routinely used in children. Most of us as providers would probably recommend melatonin first and trying some habit changes and really changing the routines to see if we can get an improvement. But the other thing to know is there's not very much research in people with ADHD and using these, these, these medications. Um, so I was going to take a little bit about or talk a little bit about this um, study 
um, that was done on kids with melatonin. Um, up here in this column here was the um, the number of kids that they were in the melatonin group. I guess I cut that off. And this is 52 is the number of kids that didn't use um, melatonin. And this is kind of their demographic. So you can see here they're mostly boys, which is pretty um, consistent with how ADHD is diagnosed. Um, and then some other things going on with the kids. But this is the one that I really wanted you guys to take a look at. Um, here, this is the melatonin group, and this is the placebo group. So the placebo group means they got a sugar pill or you know something, they didn't get melatonin. But what they found is at baseline, um, these kids were taking a while to fall asleep, and then when they received melatonin, we saw, sorry, um, we, they saw about a half an hour decrease in the amount of time that it took to go to sleep. Um, and you can see that all the way across the board here in the, in the melatonin group. So they fell asleep faster. They probably slept longer. Um, they had about 19 or 20 minutes um, higher amount of sleep. And their sleep efficiency, which was how well did they actually sleep, um, improved. As, improved. So there's mixed results on stimulants. And I actually learned a little bit about this too when I listened to some of the uh, adults that talk, that are some of the providers that treat adults with ADHD. But the research just pretty much reveals a lot of mixed results. Additionally to the research, there's also experts in ADHD that also disagree about the effects of stimulants on sleep in kids. So some people might sleep better with a short acting evening dose of melatonin while others are worse. Um, and again, sleep hygiene and changing sleep practices are the first line treatment for sleep problems. Um, some adults will say they need the evening dose, um, if, especially if they get rebound symptoms, and we think the rebound is from when they come off their stimulant. Um, and I put two studies here one year apart from each other, not too long ago, showed that a meta-analysis, which is when they look at a bunch of different studies and they try to combine results into one big study, even though there were several different studies done, that stimulants impair the sleep of children and adolescents. And then the very next year, the other group did a baseline sleep study. And then six months later, um, after starting methylphenidate, um, they found that it didn't seem to make sleep worse. The sleep problems kind of stayed the same. So it's important then when you go into your provider to make sure that you're talking about any sleep concerns that you have. So a sleep study is a, it's a formal test to evaluate for the, some of those sleep problems that we talked about. So sleep disorder, breathing, periodic limb movement disorder, and any other things that um, we're concerned about. So it measures all of this stuff and gives us an objective number. How many times do you stop breathing? How many times do you move? How much does it really disrupt your sleep? Um, the other thing that I came across, which I actually didn't know, is that narcolepsy um, is a condition that also might be a little bit more prevalent in, pe in people with, with ADHD. If you're being evaluated for narcolepsy, you stay for the overnight study and then you stay during the daytime the next day for like a nap study to see how fast you fall asleep. So this is um, some research from um, a different paper that talked specifically about mornings. And again, the parents here and maybe even people with ADHD, if they're watching, already know this, right? Mornings are rough. In, in houses um, that have children with ADHD. So you can see here that the early morning routine and the evening, the bedtime, evening, or homework routine are kind of the hardest times of day, which kind of makes sense because there's no metas, there's no stimulant on board here. Uh, but we also see that in the morning, um, parents are rating their kids with mild impairment, moderate, you know, half of the kids have moderate impairment in the morning. And then here's what the in this chart down here, the parents kind of listed specifically what they're seeing. And here, impulsive acts without thinking and fails to finish things um, in the morning are kind of the biggest problem. And so obviously, that's, that's an issue when we're trying to pack up and get dressed and eat and get brush teeth and everybody needs to get out of the house. Um, so here we have, again, um, some of the struggles that, that caregivers or parents are having about the morning routine. It's overwhelming. Almost half of parents found that it's overwhelming. It's exhausting just to get through the morning routine. Lots of yelling. Stressed. So again, this is, this is, this is information on parents of children with ADHD. 
So the morning struggles. Many adults will report feeling foggy or not really even alert until mid to late mornings. Um, so one of the best things they say to help kind of wake people up is getting some natural light in the morning. So if you don't routinely open the blinds and do things like that, they say that's one of the best things that you can do in the morning. The other things that might just be tips to help out is getting ready the night before. So anything that you can have ready to go for the morning the night before, like pick out the outfit the next day, what shoes, pack the backpack, setting out, you know, your dry breakfast goods. If you're tomorrow, we're going to have cereal. Okay. Then the cereal sitting there, the bowl sitting there, this, the utensils are sitting there, all that kind of stuff. And then making a cons consistent and predictable routine. So you can use checklists every morning if you have a whiteboard or you can, um, you know, make one or you can use visual charts like in the morning, here's the four things we need you to do. Get dressed, brush your teeth, eat breakfast, grab your backpack. Um, the other thing is some people report using a kitchen timer for kids that are like, they, they can do it, but sometimes they need a, an impetus to get going is, you know, when the timer goes off, you need to have this, this, and this done for kids that can remember to do three things without any type of um, visual cue. Um, eliminating distractions. I know commonly one of the things that I do in my house is we, we turn on the TV. You know, we're watching things, but sometimes that might be too distracting for, for people with ADHD. So just getting up and getting the, the tasks that needed to be done first before turning on the TV. And then keeping essential items near the garage door, the front door, whatever door you're going out. Shoes are stored there, backpacks are stored there, coat is right there, everything is right there. So you grab it on your way out. The other thing that a lot of people will do I hear is maybe they'll go in, you know, your child is supposed to wake up at 6.30 for school, but we go in there at six o'clock, give them their medication. So at 6.30, it might already have some working. Same thing for um, people that use the patch and adults will do the same thing. They kind of say for adults that do two waking, two, two awakening. So one, about 30 minutes to an hour before they're getting up for adults that need to take medication that really struggle in the morning. Ah, okay. So that's it. Um, you guys probably know there is a newer medication out on the market that's taken at night um, that's supposed to kick in about eight hours later. Um, to help people with um, morning routines. You guys probably also know that anytime there's new medications, they're expensive and not all insurances cover them. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a struggle in many, in many ways. Um, but I'd like to um, thank Dr. Moody, who's one of the psychologists I work with for um, kind of setting up this talk with you guys. Um, and to my husband, who's watching our children and has them out at the park right now, which is why I have no one here to quiet the dogs when they when they bark. So um, here's my references. If anyone wanted to look anything up, a lot of them can also be found on um, PubMed if you like to do any type of um, research. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and then would love to, to hear from you guys on, on what you think or questions, comments. Thank you for that. It was a great talk. Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And if anyone else wants to unmute and ask questions, go ahead. And if you're too shy to do that, you can certainly type in the chat box and I will read the questions for you. Looks like we've got someone who unmuted. Do you have a question? Do you have any um, techniques for getting the children off of electronics? Oh, yeah. No, that's that's a tough one. That's part of that transition. Um, we usually would kind of say, especially depending on age, is rewarding the good behavior. So when they do it how you want them to do it, which is, okay, we need to get you off the electronic, then they get perhaps a, a positive reinforcement for that. Um, and then the, you know, the which the reinforcement might be different based on a younger kid versus a, a teenager. Um, so kind of finding something that they really want, they really would like, um, for doing the desired behavior um, might be a, a trick if you haven't already tried that one. Good question. Another question would be the like the melatonin or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, my son won't, he doesn't want to take any sort of medication at all. Yeah. So I, you know, I even got different kind of melatonin. I had got the gummies or yeah. whatever. Yeah. It have anything to do with them. Well, um, yeah, that's a, that's a hard one right there. Kids that refuse to take medication. 
same type of issue in the mornings then for, or I just the be, sleep? I can get them to take them in the morning. Okay. But so you know, probably I some another one, forget it. <laughs> okay. So probably some, a little bit of that bedtime resistance if it works and then, oh, I don't want to take that because it is going to make me sleepy. So mm -hmm. then I would say, you know, it's hard, it's hard to be a parent. So I would say kind of pick your battles if he refuses to take the melatonin, maybe work on some of those other, um, you know, behavioral or habit changes. And it sounds like maybe, you know, the video games and the electronics would be like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We need you off the, the video game at this time. And if you do that, then you're going to be rewarded with this, you know, or, or things like that. And if other parents or if Kristen, you had any thoughts on these things too, I learn a lot from parents and what they tell me they've tried and has worked. Um, so I'd love it if other people had, had tips as well. But um, I would say don't make the melatonin a battle at this time. If there's other things that we could, you know, try to try first. As far as the melatonin, um, you had mentioned that there are some people who um, believe in giving it earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I know Dr. Craig Canapari, I don't know if you've ever seen, he's a sleep specialist. Okay. He has a great blog. I think it's drcanapari.com. Okay. Um, he wrote an extensive blog post on um, melatonin and great graphs on why it's better given earlier. Um, uh -huh. I wonder if your son would be more open to taking it around dinner time uh -huh. when it's not that bedtime fight because by that time when they're super tired, they're more oppositional with everything you try to do. Mm -hmm. So there might be some benefit to it. Um, I know when we used it in my family with my kids, we always did it right before bedtime, did it under their tongue, the liquid that um, got absorbed faster that way. Um, my kids like the taste of it. You know, you have to find one that they like, all of that stuff. Yeah. So we did it right before bedtime and it worked, but I have, there is some good evidence that giving it even earlier and it might help behaviorally. Yeah. Oh, I think that's a great tip. Good to know. Yeah. Making it more like a dinner time or an after school medicine, depending on what time. Um, I see a question here. Uh, is there a brand of melatonin you'd recommend? No, I don't have a specific brand. I think um, I agree with what Kristen said that kind of finding, you know, if they like gummies, you can find gummies. If they would rather have liquid, you can look for that. If they'd rather take a tablet, then you can look with that because melatonin comes in many different brands, obviously, and many different um, formulations. Kristen, do you have a favorite that you use? Favorite brand? Um, I know in my family, we got, um, it was a liquid spray and my daughter liked the orange flavor. It also came in mint. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what brand it was. We got it at um, Vitamin Shop, but I think yeah. there's something similar at Whole Foods. Um, it really depends on what your kids will do. I mean, that's the whole Agreed. thing. And none of them are regulated and you touched on this not being regulated means we don't know exactly what's in it. And I really dislike that our country has decided not to regulate any of these supplements because I wish they were regulated. So we knew what was in it for real and right. even if it, was over the counter, it would be better if they're regulated. Yeah. Christine, I have a question. Christy, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is because of the COVID-19, the kids are sleeping all morning and stay late, how early do we have to start uh, arranging their time? It's about like two weeks or three weeks we have in yeah, September I'm, 8th. Yeah, I would, I would think, you know, depending on how late they're sleeping compared to when they need to start um, waking up. Um, you know, I, you know, I had someone today who was sleeping till 11 and I was like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. we, you need to, we've got a, a long way to go from 11 a.m. Yes. until, you know, 6 a.m. Yes. So if they're sleeping till 11 a.m., I would say, you know, start waking them up at 1030 okay. for the next, you know, week or so and then go to 10. But that that's still pretty late. You know, um, if they're older kids, you might be able to do a little bit of a, almost like a cold turkey that, okay, we're going to go from 11 to 9 this week if they've got it. Because those older kids who go to school earlier, um, and have circadian rhythms that tell them to stay up later and sleep later naturally it's going to be a little bit more work so it might be a little um more of a push to get them if they're sleeping till 11 then just go to 10 10 a.m waking them up for the next week and then go to 9 a.m the week after that and then 8 a.m the week after that so it's not as big of a adjustment the week school starts does that 
Is that, does that answer the question? Yes, it did. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there a point in time that you recommend a sleep study? Is there, is there a trigger that you'd say, oh yeah, that the, the sleep study is needed versus just um, the melatonin or the scheduling? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I usually kind of go through some of the details. You know, I typically ask what time is bedtime? How long does it take to fall asleep? Are they waking up at night? What time do they wake up in the morning? And then some basic stuff like, okay, so you're, it takes a long time to fall asleep. So I'm going to be thinking about um, restless leg syndrome and some of those medical conditions. And then if I hear about rest, are they restless when they sleep? Because people will be like, I think so, because I hear him banging up against the wall or, yeah, he falls out of bed. Like those are all, or he wakes up in a burrito in his, in his um, sheets and stuff because he's tossing and turning all night long. Then I'm going to be like, well, then we, we kind of need to know what's going on, if anything, in his sleep, if we can make it better. So my, my thing would be if they're restless and tossing and turning, we've checked the ferritin, we've tried supplementing with iron, and we're not getting anywhere. At that point, I would probably say, let's um, consider a sleep clinic appointment or a, a sleep study to see if we can find out exactly what's going on. The other thing that I would be, con that I would, you know, be more likely to say, okay, let's let's go to a sleep study or ear, nose, and throat doctor would be snoring. So if they're snoring, um, and parent, you know, a lot of parents will be like, oh yeah, they snore and they choke and they cough and we can hear them all night long, and, you know, and all that stuff. That for me right there would pretty much be an automatic trigger for um, a sleep evaluation or ears, nose, and throat. Or you know, sometimes we try some medications first as, as well, especially during COVID when. Nobody wants to have to have an extra appointment, you know, if you don't have to. And, um, but those would kind of be my, my triggers. If we've tried something for a restless sleeper, like iron, it's not working. And then snoring would be my two big triggers. Okay. That's helpful. We okay. might, we might be there. <laughs> okay. Yep. Good. You guys have great questions. Ah, here we go. Do you have any thoughts on it on extended use? Yeah, so um, I think extended use melatonin is um, fine to use. Um, that's my, especially if they, for people who wake up a lot at night. Yes, the, the bottles do say if you have to use this longer for, you know, two to three weeks, then you should, you know, notify your provider. And I think that would be, you know, that I think that's important. I think they should know that as well if you're using a medication because your child's not sleeping. But I do actually recommend, okay, so with melatonin, they're falling asleep better, but they're still waking up at night. Um, and we don't think it's, you know, anything to go for a sleep study for. Again, because sleep can be habit, so there's different other reasons why people wake up at night. But um, then I would say, yeah, try the extended release melatonin, especially if they wake up and they can't fall back to sleep then I would say extended release melatonin um, would probably be helpful. I think we have to remember too that whenever um, you're using something over the counter, they put those disclaimers on because they wanna make sure you're getting the proper treatment. So that basically encourages you to talk to your provider, as Jamie said, so that you don't miss out on learning about, oh, they really have this sleep disorder that needs to be treated medically in a different way. So as long as your provider knows about it and has really talked to you about it, not just, oh yeah, good, you're on that, and dismisses it without going into why your child needs it um, to eliminate or at least assess for the other things. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah, there. yeah I agree. Um, we always kind of like to know, you know what people are using at home. Because sometimes every, every once in a while someone comes up with something that I haven't heard about either. And so I like to go research it, um, you know, different things like that. So, yeah. There was also a comment earlier. Um, Allison had mentioned that the melatonin that dissolves on the tongue is good. So kind of answering that question. Yeah. Good Good stuff, you guys. Thank you. Any other questions? My lighting has gone as my room has gotten darker here. Yeah. I was thinking that myself. I was like, oh, I, I don't usually have meetings in the evening, so I hope my light is okay. You guys all look great. 
Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. That. Thank you. This is very informative. Good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. Good luck, everybody. Excellent. And thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you. All of thank you so much. Totally volunteer. So we really do thank you from the bottom of our hearts to yeah. spend your own time on a night that you probably could have been doing anything else hanging out with your family but yeah thank you. no that's okay this was fun I was, I was looking forward to it so thank you for having me I appreciate it well if you want to come back and talk any other time all right <laughs> sounds good all right all right thank thanks you. bye bye bye